The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. It was hosted by a Canadian for almost four decades, and it tested contestants five nights a week. If you buzzed in with, what is Jeopardy?, you nailed it. Tonight, author Claire McNear explains why they put answers in the form of questions and how Alex Trebek was essential to the landmark quiz show. Then, we revisit a conversation from earlier in this season with three supremely talented Canadian novelists about how they imagined pandemics before one actually came to pass. It's Monday, January 4th, and that's next on The Agenda. Since 1984, Sudbury, Ontario's own Alex Trebek hosted the game show Jeopardy. His death last November is certainly the end of an era. But as the iconic quiz show looks for its next chapter, a new book chronicles its story so far. It's called Answers in the Form of Questions, a definitive history and insider's guide to Jeopardy. It's written by Claire McNear, who is also a staff writer for The Ringer, a sports and pop culture website and podcast network, and it brings Claire McNear to our virtual studio tonight from Washington, D.C. Claire, it's so nice to meet you, even if only virtually. Congratulations on the book. Uh, I do want to start with a, uh, you know, a bit of a sad question, which is how bittersweet was it for you to have a book that you worked so hard on come out the same week that the world lost Alex Trebek? Yeah, absolutely. It was it was profoundly bittersweet. I mean, I think I I had the great joy of spending a lot of this year thinking about Jeopardy and thinking about Alex Trebek and and you know, it really felt like a personal loss in a way, but I had the honor of getting to to know him a little bit and speak with him for this book. So, uh, I'm I'm grateful that I got that time. If I've heard this question once, I've heard it dozens of times, which is how in heaven's name did he manage to battle pancreatic cancer and tape shows right up until the end? How did he do that? I I mean it's it's amazing. And from talking to the staff members at Jeopardy, they they honestly had the same question because between tapings, a, a typical day at Jeopardy, they tape five games back to back to back to back. And between games, when you know he was kind of in the midst of this battle with cancer, he would go back to his dressing room and and he spoke about having to curl up on the floor weeping from the pain. Uh, you know he he would come in days after he'd had surgery, in the midst of chemo, but he just he he came alive once he was on the Jeopardy stage, and and he said that that was the place that he really felt like himself, even as he was in the midst of all of this. It's an interesting uh, insight into his personality that even though he knew he had so few days left on earth that's what he wanted to do with his time what do you think it mm -hmm. says about him I, it, it speaks so much to his character. He, his last day in the studio was just a week and a half before he passed away. He, I, I've read quite a lot of old interviews with Trebek, and, and really from early on, he would kind of joke about like, oh, I can't wait to be retired. I don't want to do this forever. But he just loved that show, and he loved the staff, and he loved making that show and it, it meant so much to him and, and I think it was just a joy it was a joyful thing for him well we do want to show a clip here uh, this well I won't set it up let's just say it's final jeopardy here's a contestant named Dhruv Gaur and he gave this as his final answer Sheldon if you would Dhruv you're smiling I like that let's take a look at your response did you come up with the right one no what is we love you that's very kind <laughs> thank you Costio, 1995. You're left with five bucks. Okay. You know, for a guy who was really very, how do we want to say it? I mean, he was pretty icy throughout much of his time at Jeopardy, right? That was a moment. That was a moment. What'd you think of that? Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm finding myself tearing up even having watched that uh, a million times. Um, I, I think it, it, of course, seeing somebody like Alex Trebek choke up on stage um, is is a huge moment. But I think for fans of Jeopardy, it, it is this amazing show where where people grow up with it, and uh, you know it's it's in your home five nights a week, year after year, and he really begins to feel like a member of the family. So I think that was just such a moment for Jeopardy fans because there there is that feeling of love and warmth towards him.
Yeah, when I say icy, I guess I, I, I guess I mean he, he, he really played it straight and straight ahead and very businesslike, occasionally cheeky, occasionally snippy when he thought you were, you know, really <laughs> dumb and missing a question or, or forgetting to put it in the form of a question, if I can rip off the title of your book. What was he like when you interviewed him? Yeah, I mean, I remember going into my first interview with him in his dressing room. This was early 20, 2019. And I was really, really nervous. I was I was afraid, would I mispronounce something? Would he would he correct me? Would he be disappointed in me? Because he is this sort of authoritative figure uh, if you've grown up with Jeopardy. But he was so he was so warm and he was so funny. He was he was much looser when he was off camera and he would swear and he would talk about drinking and he knew that that people kind of were surprised by this side of him or or when he changed into his like t-shirt and jeans and and got into his pickup truck to drive home, uh, he he was just such a such a genuine person. But he also really was this character he kind of played on stage, like one of the one of my favorite discoveries from writing the book is from talking to a lot of contestants and while while you watch an episode of Jeopardy you could often see Trebek go over to the contestants at the end of the episode and he shakes the champion's hand but you can't hear what he's saying and what I learned is that more often than not he was just talking about the final Jeopardy clue like he wanted to know how the people who'd gotten it had gotten there like were they guessing did they actually know it how did they know it or for the heartbroken people who did not get it he was kind of like doing a grandfatherly child like, oh, come on, you knew that. Like, it was, it was very sweet. So he really did care about this trivia. He really thought it was important to know these things. You know, I watched a lot of Johnny Carson when I was your age, and uh, I always asked myself, how does a guy from the plains of Nebraska turn into the, you know, the biggest sensation in late night television ever? And I know a lot of people from the province of Ontario are probably asking the same kind of question about Alex. How does a guy from Sudbury, Ontario, you know, get to be the host of the of the biggest name quiz show in history. How does that happen? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, and, and, you know, Trebek was very, very humble. And he really described his life and his success as just a series of lucky breaks. I don't think anybody who's ever watched him on TV would believe that. But, uh, you know, he said it was because he was bilingual and he spoke French that he got promoted up through the CBC, which, of course, led to eventually this game show career down in Los Angeles. Um, but he he famously just worked very hard. Uh, when you watch Jeopardy, it, it almost looks easy what he's doing. And of course, we loved his his fancy pronunciations of things, but it was so good. And those pronunciations were so good because on tape days, he would show up at the studio at 6 a.m., sit down with the day's material, crack open a dictionary, just make diacritical marks. He studied. He worked. He really, every day that he made Jeopardy, he worked so, so hard on it. And and I think that, you know, he, he was humble about it, but... He was there because he was really good at it and he really put in the time. Well, in which case, how much of the show's success is him and how much of the show's success is the fact that it's a fascinating show and, of course, it, it is the complete opposite of every other program on television in as much as, you know, they give you the answers, you've got to come up with the questions. So format versus host, where do you come down? Yeah, I mean, he was the first to say that Jeopardy would go on long after him and that the game itself is, is you know, kind of the main attraction there. And uh, that, that, of course, the staff is so good and the writers are so good uh, that, that that's not going to change. And and I do believe that. I do believe that Jeopardy itself is a really great game. And, it, and of course, we see that in that there was a version of Jeopardy before Alex Trebek with Art Fleming. Um, and that was also very popular, even though it was kind of a different sort of Jeopardy. Um but of course, it's it's so hard to imagine Jeopardy without Alex Trebek, um, and it's intensely bittersweet. And I, I mean, I know there's a lot of anxiety amongst fans and doubtless at the show about, you know, what what will it be like once he's no longer the host? Well, as there should be, because let, let's face it, there've been a lot of attempts at spinoffs of Jeopardy. I, I hadn't heard, frankly, of most of them until I read your book, and they all failed. So he may be the you know he may be the secret sauce in all of this, eh? Uh, to some degree, I think that's definitely true, um, and and I, I think it will be really hard not to to compare whoever the next host is with him. Um, but it, it's the actual uh, formula of Jeopardy is so strong, and also I think there's there's an element of the fact that Trebek himself was not a superstar when he took over Jeopardy. He was not, certainly not anonymous in in Canada or in the U.S. But he was not this kind of star celebrity hiring that, of course, Jeopardy was going to be the smash hit with him. And, and he kind of became that 
with Jeopardy. So that gives me a little bit of confidence in, in what the future might hold. Claire, I've got to ask you two very bizarre questions here. What did Alex die from? Uh, he passed away from complications of pancreatic cancer. What did Art Fleming die from? Also pancreatic cancer. Got the diagnosis and was dead two weeks later. How bizarre yeah. is that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a monster of a disease. And and I think that the Trebek absolutely knew that. And, and he, he kind of joked about it. He had this tremendous sarcastic sense of humor, the self-deprecating sense of humor. And uh, I mean, he knew the odds he was up against because, of course, he, he knew Art Fleming and he knew what had happened. And um, and he fought till the end. And, and I think that he... Even as he struggled, I think he knew that by being public about his fight with cancer, uh, a lot of people who've gone through something similar really took a kind of comfort in that. Hmm. Let me take you back to the mid-1980s, because, of course, Art Fleming started the show. It had a run. It got canceled. I think they brought it back for a year. And then, and then you know, there was no Jeopardy for a while. They then resurrected it in the mid-1980s with Alex Trebek. Why, what was the thinking behind resurrecting a show that had already been canceled? Yeah, I mean, the cancellation was a funny thing where they tried a different time slot back at NBC, this Art Fleming version, and it didn't really work. Uh, so there were a few things kind of compounding that that happening. But uh, with with Jeopardy, when it came back in 1984, Trivial Pursuit had just launched a couple of years earlier and had become this kind of craze throughout the U.S., throughout North America, I think. And, and there really was this moment of trivia obsession. So Merv Griffin, the creator of Jeopardy, had Wheel of Fortune on the air and was looking to kind of experiment with syndication and and you know decided well you know let's try bringing back jeopardy and see what happens i always thought merv griffin was the most brilliant guy in the world but but no i read in your book it was his wife who came up with the idea <laughs> of giving the the answers and you come up with the questions now that was brilliant is that known because i'd never heard that before yeah, I mean, I think it's it's been written about a little bit, but uh, she she really she was the one who came up with this ingenious um, formula, and and I I have wondered often if Jeopardy would be as popular as it is uh, if you didn't have that silly what is who is gimmick, and it is a gimmick. Uh, but I think there's something about it that if you were just saying the the answers or the questions <laughs> rather, uh, not as questions, uh, it, it doesn't really have that kind of sticky staying power. So I think that has so much to do with the success of the show. Now, not everybody watching this right now is going to remember Weird Al Yankovic. You have to be in a certain generation. But Weird Al used to take very famous songs or cultural phenomena or something like that, and he would do spoofs on them as music videos. And they were often very good. He did one on Michael Jackson's Beat It, which he called Eat It, which was hilarious. And he did one called I Lost on Jeopardy. How much credit do you give him for Jeopardy's resurrection? Yeah, the timing was really, really interesting with that. And I was able to interview uh, Weird Al for this book. Um, and the the song actually came out just months before uh, the Alex Trebek version of Jeopardy debuted. Um, in fact, some of that was just sort of kismet in that uh, Weird Al had sort of separately devised this, and it was really about the original version of Jeopardy, uh, and it just happened to come at exactly that time. But Merv Griffin, who, you know, what had a kind of genius to him with showbiz, really recognized it as this cross-promotional opportunity. So he had Weird Al on his talk show, and it really kind of became this anthem and got stuck in people's heads. And suddenly people were thinking about Jeopardy again for the first time in years. And I think that had a lot to do with people being excited to see Jeopardy come back on the air just after that. And Art Fleming was in the video and was great, playing it, playing it straight and so funny. Didn't you think so? Absolutely. And and uh, yeah, Weird Al was, was delighted that he was able to get Art Fleming to actually come down and be in the video. He, like Trebek, I think really had a sense of humor about himself. And, and so much of Jeopardy is this very serious, very stern, authoritative thing. But both of them were really, you know, willing to, to poke fun at, at that character as well. Indeed. Claire, how do you get to be a contestant on Jeopardy? Oh, it is so hard to do. That was one of the great joys of working on this book was I got to speak with a lot of contestants. Um, every year, about 100,000 people take the online contestant test. And of those 100,000, only about 2,500 are invited to auditions, usually in person this year, of course, online. And of that group, only about 400 are invited to tape in a, in a single uh, season of Jeopardy. So the numbers are 
tough. And there are really brilliant people who spend years and years and years trying to get on Jeopardy. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's this fascinating thing. If you, you look at James Holzhauer, who of course had that sensational 32 game win streak in, in 2019, uh, he, he tried to, to get on Jeopardy for over a decade. He was taking the online contestant test every single year for more than a decade before he was finally chosen. Hmm. Well, I gather you don't just have to be brilliant to win. But uh, again, I read in your book, you got to figure out how to use that clicker. What's the deal with the clicker? Yeah, yeah, the the signaling device, the infamous signaling device. It's it really is this uh obsession of a lot of contestants because it is such a big part of the game. What you can't really see when you're watching a game of Jeopardy is that there are these blue lights that wrap around the board and effectively tell contestants the exact moment when they can ring in. And if they hit the button before those blue lights have illuminated, they will be temporarily locked out of the system for just a quarter second, but usually that's long enough that somebody else can swoop in and answer instead. So if you're not good with the buzzer, you can know a whole board of Jeopardy and you will never get to give a single answer. So it it is this, this incredible um, reaction time test really tacked on to the actual game of, of Jeopardy. And who's that celebrity who's really good at it and he's got a bad thumb, which actually perversely helps him in this case? Yeah, Michael McKeon. He's, Michael McKeon. He's the biggest, the biggest ever celebrity Jeopardy contestant. He graciously spoke to me as well, and and he does. He had a a, a mishap with his thumb at some point, and so he uh, he has a kind of unusual way of bringing in, but it it sure seems to work. Now Ken Jennings, I think most people have heard of. He won seventy four straight, and he's the all time Jeopardy champ. What did he attribute his success to? I mean, he, he's interesting because he he had a background in Quiz Bowl, which is this um, academic competition that that has a lot of the same trivia uh, grounding as as a show like Jeopardy. Uh, but he's also really, really good on the buzzer. Um, and he he actually doesn't look at those lights around the board. He he would go by the sound of Alex Trebek's voice. He would kind of enter this Zen state uh, and, and just get the timing exact, exactly right. And certainly he had a lot of practice, so. He's going to be the uh, interim host, right, while they look for a, a permanent host? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems that they will have a series of interim hosts, so we don't know how long um, Ken will be doing it, but he's going to be the first interim host, yes. Do, do you know whether he wants the gig full-time? I asked him this a, a couple years ago, of course, before Trebek's diagnosis, um, and, and he joked to me that, you know, if, if, if called upon, he would certainly serve his country and serve his game show. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a thing that he has contemplated before, at least. He'll do it for God, Queen, and Country. So nice to hear. That's great. <laughs> well, we talked about Weird Al's spoof a while ago, and, of course, Weird Al's not the only guy who's been spoofing Jeopardy. Saturday Night Live does a pretty good job of it as well. So why don't we show a clip of that as well? Sheldon, if you would. Sean Connery, it's still your board. Uh, I'll take swords for 400. It's actually not swords. <laughs> Sir. Swords. These are words that begin with S. The answer is Popeye is this sort of man. Burt Reynolds. What is Popeye? No. Uh, they've done so many of those, and Will Ferrell is just absolutely hysterical with his frustration. Why do you think all that works so well? I, I mean, I think it, it speaks a lot to how omnipresent and universal Jeopardy is, that that format kind of lets you have so much fun with it. Um, you know, everybody knows the kind of central joke. And if, uh, Trebek was always asked, aren't you offended by Will Ferrell's uh, impersonation of you? Because it is a really kind of uncharitable version of Trebek. He's mad. He hates his contestants. He's the smartest guy in the room, and he wants you to know it. He can't wait to get out of there hates it all um and, and trebek said that no in fact he loved he loved that impersonation and uh and he he just had so much fun with it claire i do have to ask you though one thing what is a potent potable anyway <laughs> that is uh jeopardy jeopardy ease i guess we could call it for an alcoholic drink and it is a a recurring jeopardy category yes it is there are also some recurring what do you want to call them acronyms some of them are acceptable for family television. Some of them are not. Uh, I want to talk about them all. Do you want to, I mean, they've got their own language, right? Do you want to share some of those acronyms that people say? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
there there are a lot of kind of in jokes amongst the writers recurring things that they will do like those darn etruscans is a thing that you see over and over and over and that kind of began as a joke in the writers room but the actual trivia community uh has has a really kind of intense culture this competitive culture in, uh, amongst trivia players who many of whom are trying to get to jeopardy someday and they they use all sorts of acronyms um, I'm not going to try to do the letters right now, but you either know it or you don't is is, is broken down to the first uh, the first letters of, of each of those words um, to, to you know designate the kind of trivia question where you're not going to figure it out by staring at the question. You either know this thing or you don't. You know who the first president was or the second president was or you don't. Well, do you want to tell us what RTFQ stands for? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I'm allowed to. No, you're but, not. Uh, it's a version... <laughs> Read, read the blank question. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. Well, I do want to return to this notion of, of how well this show can survive without Alex Trebek. Uh, his, um, you know, it's odd to say it, but, but even though he has died, he's still on the air. Uh, the shows that he taped are still going to be running, I think, through January, uh, through the first end of the first week of January, and then Ken Jennings takes over. Do, do you have any fears or do the fans have any fears that this show is not going to survive without him? I think Jeopardy! will certainly survive. I think that that's, that's not in question. Um, but I think there will be this incredibly heartbreaking moment where, you know, on, on a Friday, we're going to see the final episode of the Trebek era. And then on Monday, Monday evening at 7 p.m., it's going to be the first Ken Jennings episode. Um, and again, we don't know how long Ken will Ken will be the interim host, but it will be a very, very jarring, heartbreaking thing. Um, so, you know, I think that the show will certainly go on, but I, I think that um, it, it inevitably is going to be a different kind of show. And, and Trebek told me that he really, he, he was glad that he was not going to be involved in the selection process of whoever would come after him, because I think he wanted that person to have the same chance that he had, which was to to make Jeopardy his own. And, and he did a different sort of Jeopardy than Art Fleming. And that was jarring, I think, for audiences at the time. Um, but he he obviously made it wonderful and, and people love, fell in love with, with him and with his version of Jeopardy. So he never dropped a name to you of somebody he'd like to see succeed him? He had mentioned a couple names over the years. His his favorite, of course, was to say that he wanted somebody uh, somebody smart, somebody funny, somebody young and vibrant. And and Betty White was his first his first choice. <laughs> who actually does ha have an Emmy for her, her work as a game show host, I think, back in the eighties. But uh, I I don't know that Betty White is is chasing that job. But um, you know, we'll see we'll see what happens. Betty White's had a lot of encores in her career, and I think the fact that she's ninety something right now shouldn't hold her back at all. No, no, I'm sure it wouldn't. Claire, this is a little strange, but do you know what happens when you Google Alex Trebek? I, I believe there is a lovely Google in joke that they they suggest the uh, the question who is who is Alex Trebek? You got it, you got it. We did this the other day just for kicks, and when you Google the name Alex Trebek, that's what comes up. Who is Alex Trebek? I mean, how perfect is that? And it is an answer in the form of a question. <laughs> it is. It is. I'm sure he would be very proud of that. I got the feeling that we ought to leave this interview with uh, either me hitting you with a, a, a Jeopardy question or you hitting me with one. Uh, how do you want to handle this, Claire? I, why don't you ask me, but I'm going to get it wrong. Okay. Well, you might not. You never know. Um, this, <laughs> this would be something near and dear to my heart, but not necessarily yours. So let's try this. They're the best Major League Baseball team in the 21st century, having won four World Series. Four World Series. Oh, my. I'm going to say the Red Sox. Well, that would be the correct. Who, uh, who are the Red Sox? Oh, no. I, I was just going to bust your chops, for as, as Alex Trebek would, for not putting your answer in the form of a question, my dear. Oh, Claire. He what would a, not have given it to me, so. What a terrible faux pas that was. Although, I have to say, <laughs> I'm impressed that you know it's the Red Sox. The name of the book is Answers in the Form of Questions, A Definitive History and Insider's Guide to Jeopardy. It's got a foreword by Ken Jennings and Claire McNear. Its author has been our guest. It's so great to meet you, and uh, hopefully someday we'll be able to do this in person instead of virtually. But thanks so much for coming on to TVO tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Who could have imagined this pandemic is a question many have asked during this most challenging year. 
Well, in fact, it turns out that many writers have envisioned such events dating back centuries to previous plagues and epidemics. Among them are three incredibly skilled Canadian authors. They all have new books out which were written before COVID hit, but that capture the essence of this kind of event as perhaps only fiction can. Let's find out more and introduce our guests, as is our custom, from furthest away to closest to our studio. In Brooklyn, New York, Emily St. John Mandel, author of several novels, including Station Eleven and the just published The Glass Hotel. In North Hatley, Quebec, Salima Nawaz, whose latest book is Songs for the End of the World. And in London, Ontario, Emma Donahue, whose most recent book is titled The Pull of the Stars. And it's great to have you three, speaking of stars, you three superstars with us tonight here on TVO. I want to go around our virtual table here and explore what you three have written. And Emma, I'll start with you because your book takes us back 100 years to the previous global pandemic, the Spanish flu. When did you decide you wanted to write about that time? October 2018, I was reading an article in The Economist about the centenary of the great flu. And I was just so seized by the idea that it would have had a sort of almost a post-apocalyptic atmosphere because this was a, a busy modern time, people, you know, dashing to work on trams and buses and using electric light. It was, it was our kind of world, but everything had to suddenly grind to a halt. So I decided I'd write a novel with no thought of contemporary relevance. And I handed in the last draft on the 3rd of March this year. And then it's completely overwhelmed and startled um, by any, you know, link to, to COVID. Well, that's the thing I want to nail down. When you were thinking about this for the first time in 2018, you had no inkling that you were actually going to be on the most important topic two years hence. It just proves that you should always write about what interests you rather than trying to anticipate the trends because it's not, it's not like you could have seen it coming. That is fascinating. Okay, Salima, the title of your book, Songs for the End of the World does suggest that um, an apocalyptic pandemic is on the way. When did you decide to write that? Uh, I first planned it in the fall of 2012 and then wrote it between 2013 and 2019. And similarly, any premonition that a coronavirus would be in our future in the way that it is? No, not, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you want to call that? Just um, incredible prescience or dumb luck or what? Um, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go with incredible prescience, shall we? Sure. Makes Sounds sense good. to me. Emily, uh, it's been six years since you wrote Station Eleven, which also presages the end of the world by a pandemic. And uh, I guess I'll ask you the same question. Did you have a hunch when you wrote it that a massive global pandemic that was going to kill hundreds of thousands of people was on its way? Uh, not specifically, but what very quickly becomes clear if you research the history of pandemics is that the history of humanity is a history of pandemics. You know, we've just been struck by one pandemic after another. And what, what really struck me in the research for Station Eleven is that epidemiologists talk about pandemics really in the same way that seismologists talk about earthquakes, which is to say that no serious person asks I wonder if there will ever again be another earthquake. You know, there will always be another earthquake, and there will, unfortunately, always be another pandemic. It's just part of our history. That is true, and yet, even as recently as SARS, which was 2003, we got the sense after SARS was over that, phew, okay, we, uh, you know, yes, 44 people died in Toronto, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Thankfully, we have dodged that with no thinking that the next one was just around the corner. Do you have any idea why we think that way? I think it was a mass failure of imagination. You know, I find myself a little bit haunted by the period immediately before the pandemic, which is to say three weeks or so before Emma handed in her novel in February into very early March, where even though we knew what was coming, we could read the headlines, we were still shaking hands with strangers and taking our kids to school. You know, so it's like that condition of knowing but not knowing something at the same time. I think it somehow seemed unimaginable, even when it was being reported in the New York Times, which, you know, is probably more for a psychologist to comment on than me. But I am fascinated by it. Indeed. How many copies of Station Eleven did you sell? Uh, quite some number. I know. I'm asking you to be a little more specific than that. <laughs> you know, I actually don't have the numbers in front of me. So do we just say a lot or do we say hundreds of thousands or millions or what do we say? Um, since the pandemic broke, um, 
Yeah, let's just say a lot. I haven't I haven't done the analysis for uh, a, the period. A lot works for me. Okay, that's fine. Salima, let's do an excerpt from your book. Here we go, from Songs for the End of the World. He did not really think that the human race would come through with flying colors, not ethically. People with power would fear losing it, fueling unwarranted instances of panic that would no doubt be distorted out of all proportion by the media. At a certain point, all governments traded in utilitarianism, and surviving a pandemic would become a numbers game, with the penalties and restrictions that went along with protectionism. There might not be witch hunts and persecutions like during the Black Death, but there would certainly be civic unrest and related reprisals. Harsh legislation to deal with disorder, a spreading too thin of police resources, the breakdown of law enforcement, vigilantism, the inevitability of roving looters was an idea implanted in his brain by Hollywood, but he knew it had taken root in the collective imagination all the same. Maybe he ought to buy a gun. That is so prescient, it's scary. What is the attraction for an author to want to describe what she perceives as the end of the world? Well, for me, it it sort of came from from two things. One was um, something alluded to in that passage, which is, you know, looking at other pandemic literature and Hollywood stories about disaster and thinking about what they're telling us about human nature. You know, they're they're so often saying, you know, it's going to be every person for themselves. You got to look out for number one. It's going to be dog eat dog. And I just didn't think that was necessarily true. But I was interested in what effect those stories have on our, you know, unconscious, you know, and what if we start enacting these stories we've been told about, about who we are. So I wanted to explore what I believe human nature is like and, and the effect of those stories on our imagination. And I also was just interested in a pandemic as a, as a device that connects a lot of characters. I have a lot of different characters in my book and a pandemic, of course, connects all of us. And it also has a way of of testing us in the way that a crisis can can sort of show who, who a person or a character really is. We're gonna pursue that notion of human nature and how it reveals itself during awful times a little bit later, but I did wanna throw out this other perspective in the meantime, and this is from the perspective of a reader who just made this contribution to a website, vulture.com, and she wrote, pandemic fiction is about how people behave in response to acute, sudden onset helplessness. When we're confronted with that helplessness in real life, watching some version of it any version of it, and ideally one where at least some people survive, is comforting. It's a model for how we could respond. And Emma, I wonder, when you were writing your book, did you think to yourself as you were writing it, I want to know, about, I want to know more about how people respond under these circumstances? Yes, I was really impressed, for instance, that so many, I was looking at diaries and letters by, by nurses or memoirs in which they wrote back at the, they looked back on their time during the 1918 pandemic, and they remembered it with such nostalgia. I was so impressed that so many of these women, you know, rose to the occasion and felt so needed and useful. So even though it was a grueling time and, you know, people they loved died, they were just so thrilled to be doing important work. So I thought that was one very important thing to capture. I mean, like Salima says, um, pandemics are irresistible to, to fiction writers, I think, because they, they show how people are connected. You know, that kind of, you know, vi virus, um, invisible thread between us all. It's, it's a great example of how novelists are always trying to show people's connections. And also it's a huge ethical parable. So I think both looking at ways in which people might respond to the personal fear of catching an illness, but also the ways in which healthcare workers respond to the, the vast challenge of this illness. Um, I think it's just, it's a brilliant subject. Um, which is, I suppose, why so many of us have been drawn to it. Well, let me follow up with this uh, with you, Emma, because uh, unlike the other two books, yours, yours is a real event that took place 100 years ago, and there will be historians who will read your book and certainly have an eye towards whether or not you have been historically accurate when you need to be. Obviously, you, you can take some liberties where you want, but you do have to... You, I guess there's some duty to history that you have to make sure that you get some things right. Your book is set in 1980 Dublin, how did you go about researching it to make sure that those historians who would be looking for that accuracy are, walk away satisfied? 
Well, I suppose with all my historical fiction, I, I do huge amounts of research and I never ask myself, you know, what's the bare minimum I need? I always just, uh, you know, follow up every little tangent. I go down internet rabbit holes. I, I just pour my time into it and then only use what's relevant. So I felt, I felt a particular pressure to get it right this time because I was talking about medical fact. So in previous books, if I've slightly fudged the matter of, you know, 18th century dress design, really not many people will care. But if it's doctors and nurses reading my book and most of my fan mail this time around has been from nurses and doctors and midwives, it's really important to get it right. So I was always doing a kind of a double research task on the, on the medical issues. I would look at what sources of the day said and also at what modern um, really reliable web websites would say because I was trying to make it physiologically true but then also check how they would have thought of it back then and above all what tools did they have what understanding did they have so i would look at something like how the immune system of a pregnant woman might respond by going um you know into hyperdrive in response to the flu and then i would look back in 1918 and say okay they didn't know about the immune system they didn't know what a virus was how would they understand it and what could they possibly do about it and the answer was usually watch and wait they had very little to offer they were dosing their patients with hot whiskey <laughs> I got to say, one of the things that, well, trying to have 12 kids in the middle of a global pandemic, that was certainly a heck of a trick. Anyway, that's, that's, that's just my little aside. Emily, I want to know why you, I, I guess one of the things that distinguish your book is that you really focus on life after the pandemic has already hit, as opposed to during the course of it. Uh, why did you make that choice? It seemed to me that most of the pandemic, or you know what, I'm going to back that up a little bit. Most of the post-apocalyptic literature I'd read was set in the immediate aftermath of a complete societal breakdown, which is to say this period of mayhem and chaos and horror. And it's not that I don't think that would happen. I think it absolutely would. But it's just not plausible to me that that would last forever at least not everywhere on earth. So I found myself just more drawn to and more interested in thinking, well, what comes next? What would be the new world and the new culture that might begin to emerge, say 15 or 20 years down the line? Might there be space in the world for traveling Shakespearean theater companies and groups of <laughs> traveling musicians? So yeah, I was just, uh, I was just more drawn to that timeline personally. Now, unlike Emma's book, you're not dealing with an actual real event of 100 years ago. You are free to kind of do what you want. How does one do research in that kind of circumstance? Uh, by researching the past, you know, by reading about the 1918 pandemic, for example. But that being said, I took some pretty serious liberties with the science in this book. Uh, probably the most reassuring thing I could say is that the flu pandemic in Station Eleven is not actually particularly scientifically plausible. You know, in actuality, an illness that killed that many people that quickly would burn itself out uh, before it could do too much widespread damage, which, uh, which I have to say, um, you know, a shock for me with our current situation was realizing how much social upheaval could be caused by an illness with a single digit mortality rate. It was kind of shocking to me with COVID. So yeah, I, I wouldn't call the flu pandemic in my book particularly scientifically accurate. That didn't make it any less horrifying when I read the book, I have to tell <laughs> Thank you, you, just for what it's <laughs> worth. Okay. Uh, Salima, I want to, um, boy, this is neat. We're going to put up a graphic now, which, because um, you did a lot of research too, and here's the pandemic you recreated. Sheldon, you want to bring this graphic up? Here we go. In your book, it's, it starts with a novel coronavirus from Yunnan province in China. There is an anti-Asian backlash. It is a respiratory disease that's airborne and highly contagious. People are quarantined for three weeks if exposed and everybody wears PPE, personal protective equipment. The gyms get closed. Food delivery service skyrockets, as does consumption of media. It makes its debut as a super spreader event in New York City and spreads like wildfire. That is eerily accurate to what has actually transpired. How have you managed to get so much of that right? Well, I mean, I like Emma, I did a, I did a lot of research, um, a lot of internet rabbit holes. And because I was writing for such a long time, I was working on it for so many years that I kept re-researching things. And as new um, epidemics would break out, I would sort of comb through the news looking for you know new developments. I read a lot about the Spanish flu. I read about SARS. Um, I went and read a lot of epidemiology papers. Um, 
showing, you know, the modeling of how infectious diseases spread and how um, that can be impacted by community mitigation strategies like social distancing and quarantine. Um, so, you know, all this information is out there. Um, you know, as as Emily mentioned, epidemiologists have been saying it's not a matter of if, it's, it's when it was going to happen. Um, but I just have to wonder, when COVID-19 hit and then yeah. all of these things started happening, did you start to say, oh, wow, that's like in my book. Oh, wow, that's like in my book. Oh, my goodness, that's exactly like, I mean, did you have those moments? Yes, completely. The The whole sort of beginning of, of, of COVID-19 unfolding was just a long, prolonged moment, moment like that, for sure. Was there anything that you had in the book that as you look at how COVID-19 has introduced itself to us, you thought, oh, I, I actually kind of got that wrong? Well, the thing that I find the most astounding, I mean, I did have, you know, sort of conspiracy theorists and people who, who don't want to follow the, the quarantine rules, but in terms of the anti-mask, movement like I knew that that was a thing back in in the Spanish flu um, pandemic but the degree to which the anti-maskers are an actual movement now I just I would have thought in a hundred years we would have made some some headway and but of course they've been emboldened by that you know terrible terrible leader in the south but now who that, might you be referring to there <laughs> that most unfortunate of <laughs> presidents um, but that, that is sadly shocking to me and something I did not anticipate and is not in my novel. I should get Emma to comment on that as well. The notion that, that wearing a mask today somehow became a political statement and, and the echoes that that might have to the time that you wrote about. That's right. They had both um, some mask laws in, in cities like San Francisco in the States and anti-mask um, leagues. Um, but... <laughs> You know, in 1918, they, they didn't know what they were dealing with in that a lot of people wore masks outside and then they would take them off when entering the building as if it was an overcoat. So in every way, I feel lucky to be around today by comparison. <clears throat> For instance, in th there, there were political techniques as well as medical techniques that they didn't have back then. There was no such thing as governments paying people to stay home and stay safe. You know, um, concepts like, you know, basic income, um, for instance, just not available then. Um, so the many ways in which governments can, you know, um, um, pr protect us from the, the larger effects, um, not available at all to, to these um, governments just struggling to get to the end of World War I. So um, I think this is an entirely different world. And I, I think our science is in a much stronger state. I mean, the, the very rapid development of a number of vaccines, for instance, no equivalent in 1918. So yes, I'm very aware of the horrors around today, but um, even more so, I'm grateful that this is now and not then. Mm -hmm. Emily, I wanna take you back five and a half years because this was no doubt one of the great highlights of your life. You were on this program. Sheldon, let's roll the clip. <laughs> Emily St. John Mandel on the agenda five and a half years ago. Roll tape, please. I go through a whole litany of things that would disappear in this scenario. No more trains, no more holding up your iPhone to take photographs of concert stages, no more electronica, antibiotics, gasoline, etc. It does end with a paragraph about the internet, which, to be absolutely honest, just between the two of us, is something <laughs> I might not miss. Um, it's been, you know, it's incredibly helpful, obviously, for research and for easily keeping in touch with people. But we are so distracted. And I didn't write this book with the aim of imparting any real message along those lines, but it's something that I think about, that there might be some value in the idea of being a little bit less dependent on you know, our little mesmerizing phones. Well, you know I'm gonna to wanna to follow up on that comment. What do you think about your little mesmerizing phones today? <laughs> You know, it is a real irony of the current pandemic that we're completely dependent on technology now. Um, you know, that somehow the pandemic has catapulted us into this world of Zoom calls, Skype, FaceTime, Crowdcast. I've gotten familiar with a dozen different platforms. Uh, it's funny. I'd somehow always imagined that a pandemic might decrease our technology. And yet suddenly here we are. No, we have uh, government leaders uh, quite frequently telling us, please download this COVID-19 app into your smartphone because this is the best way that we can track how this thing is yeah. penetrating the population. So yeah, if I've anything, got the New York more State dependent. app on my phone. You do have the New York State app on your phone. I do. Hmm. Has it wrong yet? 
No, I mean, the thing is, I don't see people. Like, we take quarantine really seriously. I'm in a three family pod. So my phone is just never within six feet of anybody who's not in our pod. So, you know, hopefully it'll never ring. Um, yeah, it's not something to worry about. <laughs> Good. Tell me as well, uh, I asked this question earlier of uh, Salima, and I, I want to get you on this as well. You, you know, the world you described is all in your imagination. And, and yet, presumably, you got some of it right as you've watched COVID-19 unfurl. What did you get right? Uh, the sense of fear. But in fairness, that would have been hard to get wrong. You know, it's so inevitable. But I, I find myself thinking more about what I got wrong, which is, you know, I think the main thing is I referred earlier to that strange interlude where we knew what was coming, but we didn't believe it. I think that before going through this experience, I'd thought of being in a pandemic as something of a binary state. You know, you're either in a pandemic or not in a pandemic. And it hadn't occurred to me that there might be this strange kind of in-between time where you're sort of in it and kind of not. Um, yeah, so that's something I think I got wrong. I, I think I got the dread right. <laughs> you got the dread right, I would agree. Uh, Emma, let me take you back again to 100 years ago, and governments then, as they did today, or as they're doing today, are trying to give, I guess, the best advice they can uh, to the population. Uh, we can have great debates about it today as to how well our governments are advising us on what to do. Uh, what's the verdict on how well they advised people back then? Um, one thing I've been startled by this year is how often the politicians in every era give very mixed, you know, weasel-tongued uh, messages because they're never simply trying to give scientific advice. They're trying to do things like boost the economy, you know. So um, back then, just as now, there was a lot of vague reassurance or or even a way of talking about the illness that effectively blamed the victims. They would say things like, don't be defeatist, that'll let the germs in, you know, which is a bit like Boris Johnson saying, stay alert, you know, um, or, or ways of implying that if you get it, it's because you made a personal mistake rather than because there was no good policy in place. Um, lots of um, blaming the poor for pre-existing conditions, um, blaming those who live in crowded conditions for the fact that, you know, they, they are going to pick up things from each other. So uh, a lot of emphasis on individual responsibility in a way which really makes no sense when you're talking about, um, you know, invisible microbes. So I put a lot of government propaganda into my book um, because I, I wanted to capture that that weird sense in which, um, you know, the advice you're getting from the authorities might, might really be um, intended for crowd control rather than intended to truly give you the most up-to-date information. So writing this book has, has made me feel passionately pro-science rather than pro-politicians and a feeling that in every era we need to find our, our Dr. Fauci's and our Theresa Tams and, and cling to them as they attempt to work out what's actually true rather than what's politically advisable or expedient. Well, let me follow up with this because when this thing first broke, in fact, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Tam both said, don't put a mask on, you probably won't do it properly, and as a result, you'll futz with it, you'll touch your face, and you have uh, you know, a greater chance of contracting the, uh, the coronavirus if you do that. Now, obviously, they changed, their, they changed their tune when it became apparent that people needed to learn how to wear masks and wear them, and, and everybody should be wearing them. Um, but, uh, but that was a change of advice. Did we have that in 1918 as well? Oh, yeah, there was complete confusion in 1918. Um, at first, they were saying, let's dose everybody with um, aspirin. They thought that was the best um, medicine for bringing down fever. And then they found that people were dying, possibly of the very high doses of aspirin. So there was a lot of like, let's back off on the aspirin. But I think that the difference is that you see scientists um, fine tuning their advice and based on things like, is there enough, are there enough masks for everyone or should we keep them for, for the doctors and nurses? So that's tinkering with their advice, but it's not a, a, a major shift like, should we attempt to prevent spread or should we not bother? So the, the, the difference we're seeing between the kind of anti-maskers who are also anti-vaccine, libertarian, that kind of me for myself and I don't care if somebody's granny dies attitude, that has never been... Um, anywhere near the kind of, you know, subtle distinctions that the scientists are making between one policy or another. Mm -hmm. So yeah, scientists may not always agree on every little detail, but they're all basically saying, let us use our collective um, sense of responsibility to stop other people from dying. Salima, as the COVID pandemic started in your novel, you've got a character named Owen, 
who had previously written a bestseller on surviving a pandemic, only to see it become a bestseller again. Hello, Emily, incidentally. Uh, he starts to freak out as he's seeing the signs pointing to a global pandemic. And I wonder whether you yourself went through all that. I, I I didn't. I think in some ways, you know, Owen, the writer in my in my novel, he's not the most um, he's not the most uh, he he doesn't have the most pristine character. Um, and so, in some ways, I didn't want to be like him. So I was kind of had this hyper awareness as you know we were getting these news reports. Um, you know, in early March, I I was like, okay, I don't want to go stock up on a, a ton of things the way Owen would do. I don't want to like lock myself in my house the way he would do. Um, and I think sort of like Emily said, that that sense of of unreality, you know, even having done all of this research, even having written this book, even having characters in the book who are hyper aware and who prepare in advance for this for this pandemic, there's this sense of, oh, it's not quite here yet. Or I'm just not sure, like, when is the day that I pull my daughter out of daycare? Um, and just sort of existing in that 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 weird state of of disbelief, even having done so much research and even having imagined um, a very similar reality in my novel. Hmm. Emily, how about you? When February turns to March and then March to April, and then we realize we're we're really in the thick of this thing here, how much do you start to say, this is sounding a, a, a bit too much like something I just wrote five years ago? I, to be honest, I was relieved that it wasn't nearly as bad as the thing I wrote. Hmm. You know, um, I think something I have with in common with parents around the world is a deep sense of gratitude that in contrast to the 1918 pandemic, children so far are usually not severely affected. So there was a feeling of dodging a bullet there that, you know, this is terrible, but thank God it's not actually Station Eleven. <laughs> Emma, how about you? Same question. Oh, I've been deeply grateful that so far, not only does COVID not look as bad as the 1918 flu, but that we have so many more tools. Um, the, the speed with which we can share information, I mean, yes, that allows disinformation to spread too, but, but in every way, we are more able to rise to this challenge than they were in 1918. And in 1918, they were still in the middle of a global war, which, you know, uh, literally spread the illness as huge populations were moved around the world, um, but also just sapped people of, of time and energy and made governments unwilling to cooperate with each other. So, you know, if we mess this up, it's really our fault. It's not that we didn't have the tools. Yeah, I do. I do recall 100 years ago, they had to cancel the Stanley Cup because one of the participating members Bad Joe Hall died in the middle of the Stanley Cup final, and this year they managed to they managed to put all the players uh, in a, in a bunch of different bubbles, and they played the Stanley Cup, and they awarded the Stanley Cup, and they gave the public a sense of normalcy that we'd get through it. You, you, I mean, that does show some sense of progress, I presume, doesn't it? Oh, I think I think there's there's no comparison. Um, we we understood and had diagrams of coronavirus within a couple of weeks. You know, in 1918, they really had no idea what they were dealing with. Um, I think, uh, I don't think anything they did got them to the pandemic. I think it just died out on its own, as Emily was saying. Um, so I think um, we're, we're in a much better state um, if only we don't allow, you know, the, the madness of, say, conspiracy theories to, to undermine um, the scientific efforts. Hmm. Since you're all three so good at predicting the future, <laughs> here we go. I want to ask you whether you think living through a real pandemic how you think that will affect dystopian literature going forward. Emily, you want to try that one first? I predict that fewer people will write about pandemics because seriously, who wants to read about this you know, when, you've, uh, <laughs> when you've just gone through it? I don't mean to undercut all of our book sales here, but it's just no longer speculative. So yeah, I would imagine perhaps fewer pandemic books over the, over the next few years. Well, isn't that interesting? Because I, I, I would take... Um, Boy, I hate to disagree with a guest uh, in the middle of a program, but I, I think we're all utterly fascinated with it now. And and don't you think the appetite, I mean, it's possible the appetite for this kind of work will be even more intense, isn't it? I suppose it is possible. I've, I've never, you know, I guess it comes down to personal preference. I've never personally recommended reading Station Eleven during an actual pandemic, which <laughs> maybe comes down to my preferences as a reader, that it's, uh, you know, I find it hard to read, to read about pandemics in a pandemic. 
But as they say, you know, your mileage may vary. Perhaps other people are having the opposite experience. (laughs) This person's had the opposite experience. Salima, how about you? How's this going to affect pandemic literature going or apocalyptic literature going forward? Well, I think, you know, from a from a writer's point of view, um, I think I agree with Emily. I think there might be fewer books about pandemics in the next little while. Just, you know, speaking for myself, I often am drawn to write something from curiosity. Like I, I was curious what it would be like to live through a time of disaster and 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 just not as the person who's, you know, stopping the meteor or finding the cure, but just as an as a regular person. Um and so, you know, having lived through this, you know, I feel like that curiosity is mostly sated, you know, <laughs> like I'm curious how this will all, you know, pan out and resolve, but but I don't have that that drive of curiosity, you know, to write a whole that you need to write a whole novel. But, but I do think that, you know, because this is the kind of crisis that humanity has faced forever, I don't think that this, these kinds of stories are going to go away. Emma, you get the last word. Well, I think what's been so interesting this year, which I would not have predicted, was the huge boost in in interest in the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, that's that's not a very obvious result of people being afraid of catching coronavirus. <clears throat> so maybe our fiction will emphasize more the kind of extraordinary social changes that you could get when a society's had a, a really short, sharp shock. Hmm. Well, I, I am going to say that... Uh... I can't get enough of this stuff right now. I don't know why, but I read Lawrence Wright's book as well. And, um, you know, we're in historic times and it requires people like you to get us through it. I'm, I guess what I'm saying is I'm disagreeing with Emily again. <laughs> bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Uh, I want to thank the three of you for joining us on TVO tonight. Emily St. John Mandel, Salima Nawaz, Emma Donahue. Great to have you all on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. And that is the agenda for Monday, January 4th, 2021. Happy New Year, one and all. Tomorrow, we'll take a look at the post-holiday COVID situation, and we hope you'll be with us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.